before. Here we go. Awesome. Thank you, Anna. Can I go ahead and share screen at this yeah, point? Yeah, go time? ahead. All right, Let's get cool. started. All right. Let me get this all going. I think everything's set up correctly. Can uh, you guys give me a thumbs up if you can see the screen okay? We're good. Awesome. Yeah. All right. So, uh, yeah, today I have the privilege of talking about what we did over the last two years at the school I was principal at um, with regards to teaching financial literacy with student behavior points. Um, if you didn't get a chance at the bottom of the registration to see my background, I thought I'd just give you a, a little heads up on who I am. Uh, my educational background, I actually studied business management, was my bachelor's degree at Georgia Tech. I quickly realized that my passion was teaching and coaching and pivoted and got my master's in education here locally in Kansas City at Rockhurst University. And then quickly after that, started my doctorate in educational leadership. Um, during that time, I was a middle school math teacher for five years, uh, then got the assistant principal job at that same school for four. And then most recently, the last two years was principal at Barry School, uh, which in its current iteration is a grades five through eight building with uh, early elementary special education as well. So a very unique building uh, in that sense. Um, to give you an update on where I'm at today, since I'm not sitting in a in an office in a school building, I actually, at the end of last year, I, desi I decided to resign. Uh, was definitely the, the most difficult decision I've made uh, in my life. Uh, someone who's obviously passionate about education and learning. Uh, but I have a family of four kids under seven and was given an opportunity to work from home and, and be with them every morning. And when they get off the school uh, school bus in the afternoon, and so I decided to make the jump um, and, and it was a, a great decision for my family. So that's where I'm at today. Um, I'm gonna kind of take you guys back to the summer of 2020, which was in the heat of the pandemic and talk to you about two problems that we had seen in education and how, uh, how could we craft a solution to address both. So um, I had just been hired as principal of Barry School. Uh, funny thing about that, I did all my interviews and everything uh, online. So hadn't met anyone face to face until I showed up day one on the job. Uh, but after being hired in April of 2020, uh, during that summer, my brother-in-law, uh, who's been in the financial industry his whole career, uh, we were just kind of sharing just problems that we saw um, in education, in the world of finance, and uh, together how they there was some synergy there. The first on his end was just talking about financial literacy, and you know obviously it's a um, an issue that we have as consumers is to consistently be in debt and that debt cycle not improving over time. Uh, the second piece on that, from my end in the in the world of education. It's figuring out how to motivate middle schoolers. Uh, I would love to say that grades uh, matter. And if you've worked in education long enough, it matters for some uh, from parents that apply that pressure. But for most, um, there's a lot of other things that motivate them. Uh, tons of research, articles, books that you can read. But at the end of the day, I, I found myself, and I think a lot of us can relate to this, is how, how do we motivate kids and how do we keep them engaged? Um, and so another fee thing on the financial literacy piece, um, I live in the state of Missouri, and the state of Missouri K through 12 only requires one semester of personal finance offered at the high school level. Um, then when you get to college, I was actually even a business degree, uh, and personal finance is not offered. And so it gets you wondering, you know, how are we expected to grow up unless our parents pour into us and our parents have the right appropriate background and success to do so? Um, how, how are we set up to be successful in managing our, our, our finances as, as adults if we're not giving ourselves the opportunity or our kids the opportunity to learn and practice? Um, and so one big piece in this was realizing, holy smokes, live school is a platform that is communication, but it's also a digital currency that can be school based and we can teach kids how to use their money um, in a way that's safe. Um, that there is no real world implications, but gives them the practice they need to be successful adults in managing real money when they get out into the real world. Uh, so some quick background on how we decided to use live school at our school. Um, we, we decided to, to uh, focus solely on behavior and work ethic. Those were our two umbrella categories with areas under each. 
where we could distribute and take points uh, based on student choices. We wanted to ensure our gradebook reflected student learning and mastery of standards, but that live school was all the things that we should be in control of, right? Regardless of our background, our learning style, things of that nature. Um, another thing I want you to know is how we structured our houses. Uh, we had a big discussion of, do we want those to be grade level or vertical? And if you're a Harry Potter fan, so think, think uh, how when kids entered Hogwarts, they joined a house as freshmen and they stayed through that house their whole time. That's how we structured it at Berry School. Kids entered a house at fifth grade and they would stay with that house through eighth grade. Um, we also thought it was important that staff be allocated to houses um, and also be vertically aligned as well. But lastly, our reward store was set up in ways that kids could buy things daily, weekly, quarterly, and annually. Um, and we'll dive deeper into that as well. Uh, I think it's important for you to know how we distributed points. So after trial and error, um, we decided to give, uh, to give points to students upon entry of the school day. So at our school, it ended up being 17 points daily. They got two points for each class, one for behavior and one for work ethic, and then one for lunch, uh, lunch behavior. And so they were given 17 points upon arrival. And if they lost points throughout the day, it would be pulled from those. Um, but they also had the opportunity to earn more for demonstrating excellence in our areas of character that we taught. Um, and then also for absences, if, if a kid was not present for a class, whether uh, excused or unexcused, however you want to categorize it, um, they weren't there to earn those points. So we removed those. So another thing that I want to share with you, I think it's important, is you know, as we were preparing to roll this out, it was interesting what I would read about financial literacy. So one thing I, I picked up on is that theory alone doesn't impact change, right? We know that beyond financial literacy. Like if you just teach kids about certain topics, it may make a minimal impact on their life, but if they don't have the, app or the opportunity to practice it, it's really not going to stick. And so that's what a lot of the research we were reading is that psychological practice is the game changer. So kids have to have the opportunity to use currency, make decisions, make mistakes, and that's how they're going to learn, not just teaching them about it through a personal finance course in high school. And so ultimately, our goal was, let's try to create an environment that mirrors the real world as best as possible. And beyond that first year, we had some pretty big ambitions of how we could make this real world for them with tax uh, and things of that nature. But obviously, since I'm no longer in the school building, there was a little bit of halt in that progress. I, I do want you to know how our reward store was set up, because this is a huge part of the financial literacy piece. Um, something I always talk to about the kids and the parents is an example, a temptation I deal with daily is, do I buy my coffee from Starbucks or another local coffee shop and spend five, six dollars on a drink? Or do I brew it at home and spend 50 cents? And so we are, as adults, we're faced with little decisions like that on a, on a constant basis or on social media. If you use social media, the ad personalized ads that are tracking everything we're doing and putting advertisements in front of our face, we're constantly tempted to make purchases or, or invest in that way. Um, and so our kids, I believe, need that similar practice on a day-to-day -day basis. And so what we tried to do was create that opportunity. And we did that by having daily uh, temptations, I would say. So teachers could uh, charge things at the classroom level, seating, treats, things of that nature. Uh, the office hosted a lot of things kids could buy. So we had a Google uh, request form that kids could submit, and then we would fulfill it as soon as we were able. But it included snacks, uh, early dismissal passes. We had our elementary school. That was our feeder right next door. So kids love to go back and visit with teachers or help out in the classroom. Uh, we put together an arcade room. And so they had daily opportunities where they could they could spend their money and have those temptations. We also had weekly options. So we ran an auction every week. Uh, our donors uh, that we partnered with, local businesses, gave us stuff to be able to auction off. Um, and so every day during announcements, I would do video-based announcements. We would show the items that were up for auction that week, typically to kick off the week. And so again, you, you know, we're trying to replicate real world. So on our phones, we, we have advertisements or we're driving by stores that those morning announcements was a great way to put a temptation out in front of kids and and really give them the practice of, oh, that's that shiny thing I really want right now, or do I want to save for some of the stuff down the road? 
So every quarter, we ran a quarterly incentive. Um, this typically, uh, three of the four quarters was outdoors, games, we brought in food trucks, we brought in a petting zoo, uh, but different, different opportunities for kids to save for big, big things. So for us as adults, when we're saving for a car or a college education or a wedding or a house, um, we wanted to give kids an opportunity to save for that big ticket item while managing the temptations of the daily things they could buy as well as those weekly auctions. And then finally, we ran a, a house competition, um, which you guys are all probably familiar with, but the winning house, all kids would go for free on a visit to main event. If you don't have a main event in your area, um, the best thing I can connect it to is like a Dave and Buster's if, you've, if you're familiar with that without, well, yeah, there's obviously adults can enjoy themselves there too, but that's not what the kids were going there for. So, um, but arcade games, bowling, you know, laser tag, things of that nature. And so um, what we tried to do is create, create a, an experience where they had ways to spend their money all the time. Some things cheap, some things really expensive, and they had to use their budgeting skills that we were going to teach them um, to be able to do so. And I felt the best way for kids to learn was through failing at some of this, right? So we had some kids that would buy a hat or a hood pass every day, and that quarterly incentive would come at the end of the quarter, and they wouldn't have enough money to purchase the ticket to be able to attend, um, or a kid was just doing weekly auctions every single week and, and ran out of money by the end of the quarter. And so it's safe. It doesn't impact them in the real world, but it does give them some of that experience to learn firsthand from doing things wrong. So it's one thing to, to give kids all these things to engage in, and it's another thing to prepare them to be successful. And so we, we built some local partnerships um, with these, these people here on the left-hand side, uh, the Federal Reserve, uh, Northwest Mutual. Main Street Credit Union. There's also tons of free online resources. Uh, Junior Achievement uh, is located here in Kansas City, and I believe there's some in other cities as well. Uh, and then even the credit union we're with had financial literacy programs online. So we would secure resources or people would volunteer to come in and talk to our kids. Uh, and in the heat of pandemic, we did most of this over Google Meets, or we would create a plug and play slide deck for our teachers to run with their kids in class. Um, the topics we went over with kids were interest, uh, checkings, savings accounts, bonds, mutual funds, stock market diversification, et cetera. And so uh, we always scheduled these right before the kids had the opportunity to dive in and practice some of the stuff with their live school points. One, uh, one thing I want to make note of, I was talking with Anna before the call, CRA, if you're, if you're in a district um, that serves a, a lot of low income areas, uh, CRA stands for Credit Reinvestment Act, and this heavily impacts uh, financial institution and banks. And so my brother-in-law, when we were strategizing, I, I thought my uh, building was going to be in an area where we could capitalize on this. But we found out um, through going through this process that the area I served was actually not enough low income to qualify. But if you can, if you're in an area where you think, okay, we have free and reduced lunch of kids of upwards 75, 80%, this is definitely something to explore because banks are accredited and are given scores similar to that of how school districts are um, by their state. So in Missouri, we were following MSIP 5. They're giving us a scoring based on attendance, uh, college and career readiness, overall achievement, subgroup achievement, et cetera. Banks have a similar process. And so the Credit Reinvestment Act is basically assessing, is the bank reinvesting into their community, whether it's through volunteer hours, grants, donations, et cetera. And so they can, they can really boost their scores by helping, um, and they really want to help in ways that are improving, that are having direct connect to finance. So that's something that uh, if you're in a low income area, that is something to capitalize if you would like to recreate this in your school district. So um, one thing that we really tried to do at the end of every quarter was to take what kids learned about here on these topics and give them a chance to practice. And so at the end of the quarter, the kids had options of what they wanted to do with their remaining student balance. One option was just to try to spend it. Um, and shockingly, a lot of kids didn't just try to blow their money at the end of the quarter. Um, they tried to do one of the next two things, either donate their balance to the house so whatever was left, we allowed them to give it to the house um, to help that house uh, total uh, win so that they could go to main event at the end of the year. Um, or we allowed them to mock invest in the stock market, which I'm gonna show you here a little bit. So 
This was kind of our uh, year long scoreboard. So it's broken down by quarter and by house. I'm gonna blow it up a little bit larger if I can. So the vertical columns are by house. Um, this was right here was the amount of points earned in that quarter. So blue earned 73,773 points, et cetera, et cetera. And student donations are remaining student balances that kids decided I wanna put in towards our house to help us. And their totals listed here. So for quarter one, you'll see that purple one. While all of this is going on, kids could have chosen not to donate and they could have invested in companies in the stock market, which I'm gonna show you here on, on the next tab. What we told kids is that whenever you decide to invest at the end of first quarter, at the end of second quarter, at the end of third, at the end of fourth quarter, we're gonna pull all those investments out, whether they gained or lost, and all those points are gonna go into your house at the end of the fourth quarter, which is where these investments came over. And so this was a huge learning experience because we did this in May of 2022. And if you followed the stock market at all, it tanked in the spring of 2022. So most of our kids lost a ton of money, which was great teaching tool for them because it showed them that investments in, in high risk uh, tools like the stock market are not to be done on short-term basis. They're to be done over long periods of time. Um, it taught them about the volatility of the stock market and, and we could dive into why are things getting bad? The pandemic was a great teacher for finance. Um, we could show them in graphs why in March of 2020, the airlines dropped and, and crashed, the movie theaters crashed. We could have real conversations about all of that and make decisions like, is it, should we go ahead and invest now while they're low? Do we think it's going to recover or not? So the way we structured this spreadsheet was uh, these are all of our homerooms. And in each homeroom, I, I hid students' names for privacy reasons, but um, it was the student's name, their grade, and their house. And then you'll see, I'm going to zoom back out a little bit. This box right here is first quarter for this one specific teacher with those 16 kids they were working with. Um, first quarter, we gave them the option. You can either donate or you can invest. So this is prior to teaching them about diversification. So they were either either or is what you'll see through here. So the, for instance, this kid invested his balance of 467 points into Nike. At that time in first quarter of October of 2021, the purchase price was $163.30. And then flat fast, fast forward to May, this is what it was selling at when we had to make everyone's investments go. So the kid that invested $467, if he would have donated, would have been a smarter decision than investing because it was only worth 308 points at that point in time. But ultimately, these all came over to their, um, their houses at the end of the year. So first quarter was very simple. Second quarter, we started to teach them about cryptocurrency and, and things of that nature and what's going on in that realm. Um, and they had choices again, either donate or invest. But when we got to third quarter, we just taught them about diversification and the importance of that. So you'll notice this kid donated some to the house and chose to invest some in, in the company. Um, we also had kids take the safe bet of investing into a CD, which was guaranteed return, but much smaller. Um, so kids were making choices that they then got to see how it impacted them and the rest of the people that were relying on them as well. So one, one thing I will say if, if, we came, if I would have came back this year, we would not have done this by teacher. Instead, we would have organized, by, organized these by house because what ended up happening is, you know, sometimes you need to move a kid from Saruti's room to Hayes's room and moving that data back and forth was problematic. And so if they just, they never change houses in our system. So we would organize them by house and manage their investments that way. All right. So something that... I want to show you, we surveyed our kids at the end of year one of doing this. Um, these are the, the statements that were provided to them, and they had to either strongly disagree, disagree, neutral, agree, or strongly agree. Um, 362 of the 460 kids we had took the survey, and I'll just give you a second to take a look at it.
So what our overall takeaway from this was that it had a positive impact on attendance, behavior, work ethic, and their knowledge of how to manage their money. Um, obviously, room to grow, right? The same kids that wrote disagree or, or strongly disagree, it, the percentages pretty much align all the way across for the most part. Um, those would be the kids that we would have needed to target and figure out more of how can we improve. Um, but I thought it was important. I was reflecting today, what would have my next steps been after year one? Um, if I were to have returned to the building uh, first, I would have continued to work with the credit union. So something that was really cool that they were open to was um, taking remaining student balances and converting that to actual money and opening an account with their with their credit union. So let's say I was that kid. I gave an example. There was 467 points left in my account. They obviously wouldn't do a one for one scenario, but we were going to come up with a prorated solution where let's just say, you know, one per one percent or five percent of whatever your student points are. We'll give you an actual dollars if you open a student uh, checkings account with us. Obviously, they would need a parent present and a parent to agree to that. But what a great way to build business for the credit union and provide a service for our families and kids after getting to practice this in real life. Um, the other thing I would have done is continued to add to our donors. So in year one, everything that we did from daily things that kids could buy, the auctions, quarterly incentives, uh, the annual competition for main event, we pulled that off um, just through partnerships and through selling snacks after school. Uh, we did not have to do a school-wide fundraiser to fund any of that. But with that being said, I think the more um, the more you can ensure that kids' rewards match what they want, the more it's going to motivate them. And so partnerships with banks and things of that nature, I mentioned the Credit Reinvestment Act. If you can capitalize on that with banks and get some serious funding, um, you could really make a lot of progress in this area. The next thing I've talked with Anna, I believe, or, or possibly another colleague at Live School, I think there is a huge opportunity in the Live School system alone, no matter how far a school district takes this for financial literacy, just to have their balance be able to be sorted between a checkings account and a savings account. Because um, I imagine a lot of our schools that are using Live School have bigger ticket items that kids can purchase and smaller ticket and just giving them the ability to manage in that way, I think would be huge. Um, a, a long term goal would for live school to integrate mock investments like we were doing in, in our spreadsheets. And then the last one I mentioned, you guys, was just revamping the stock market spreadsheet. Um, what I showed you, just so you know, that took me probably two to three hours, I would say, a quarter navigating all the investments after the teachers and the kids facilitated that to figure out if they made money, if they lost money, and adding it to the houses. So, uh, I'm going to I'm going to conclude my piece and open it up for questions. What I want you to know is that's that's my contact information, my cell phone and my personal email, whether it's today and you want to chat later, text or email, whatever it may be. Or if down the road you have questions or need advice on what worked, what didn't work or just bouncing off ideas, I'm I'm more than available to help you guys. So with that, Anna, I'm, I'm done on my piece and I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much um, for going through that with us. For anyone that has questions, just drop them in the chat and we can bring you on. I did have a few questions that came through directly to me that I wanted to ask you about uh, while yeah. others may be formulating some of theirs. So the first was you showed the impact that student survey data, which uh, was really interesting to see. You probably don't have data on this, but was there an impact you saw with, because financial literacy is something you said it's really, you know, family driven in a lot of ways. Did you see this trickle out even beyond student experiences to family experiences with what students were learning? Yeah, great question. So um, something I'm a huge believer in is creating a massive window to our families of what's happening in our school buildings. Uh, so right now I'm, I'm no longer the principal there. Um, and now I'm definitely like dad glasses on for my own kids, elementary experience and every school tackles this differently. Um, what we tried to do was uh, all of our morning announcements we filmed on YouTube and was made available. We did this really for the pandemic so that kids that were being forced to quarantine could see what was going on at school. But more important, our parents could watch what was being talked about and discussed, especially especially in an environment these past few years that have been so polarizing and politicized. 
Um, I think it's important for them to be able to see and hear what's going on. So we would talk about financial literacy all the time um, from the things that were being offered, but also talking about the strategies that were going on. And so, you know, when parents would come up to parent teacher conferences or at a sporting event or whatever it may be, they would talk to me about things that they were seeing and hearing and their kids were bringing home and talking to them about. Um, and then the other pieces on that, too, is I used Twitter like crazy, Facebook, Instagram, um, our newsletters and every newsletter that went out, the first section was all on live school, um, how parents could support, but what their kids were learning about since everything we did was in Google meets with the federal reserve, Northwest mutual, all that I recorded all of them. And then I made the links available to parents as well. So, um, you have different levels of parent parental involvement, obviously with, with everything in school, but this was, this was huge for us. So yes, I, I would say it was definitely a positive impact. And uh, probably a lot of questions, a lot of conversations that would have never happened if it weren't for this. Um, it was shocking to me. I got to teach some of the lessons myself. It was shocking that fifth graders, 10 and 11 year olds were able to look at graphs about the stock market and be able to speak to why the pandemic had that, that impact on that company with really not a lot of background. So uh, it, I don't think there is an age too young to start with this type of material. Yeah, and I was going to say with that, I mean, just the connection to the standards that they're probably learning too is is huge. So another question that we got directly was um, looking at how you built staff buy-in for this. Um, you're obviously yes. really very, uh, very passionate about financial literacy. So how did you get others on board for this? No, I, I think you hit it on the head is passion, right? Like so if we have school leaders on here, um, even even no, no matter who you're leading, if it's a teacher leading kids in a class or if it's a principal leading staff, it's it's about passion and energy. And so um, this is something that I believed in uh, and I felt that I was able to create that energy and that passion in folks as well. I think it's a daunting area too, right? So we talk about, we don't prep our kids well, who are we as all staff? We were kids that went through the exact same experience and, and likely it's intimidating. And so um, part of the piece of this was ensuring they weren't gonna have to do a lot of legwork. So this was done through partners or my instructional coach was phenomenal and would help put together decks for them. So a key piece of buy-in was ensuring that it wasn't gonna feel like one other thing on the plate. So that was huge. Um, the second thing was just relying on those relationships uh, as well. And then uh, the third thing we did, we did a soft implementation my first year. So I was there for two years. The first year we did this with fifth grade only. Um, we were in a hybrid environment, middle school, where we had half the kids at home, half at school, and they were flip-flopping every day. But fifth grade was there every single day. And I had four fifth grade teachers and we had just the basic version of trial version of live school. And we dabbled with it second, second uh, semester. Uh, so we, I met with them every month and we were just gathering information, what's working, what's not working. So just like anything else, when I can go to roll it out with the whole staff and say, our folks just did this, these are experts in this area. And it wasn't coming just from me, but also coming from other teachers that I think was very helpful in implementation as well. And you know, the, the thing is too, uh, when we were closing up shop on, on my tenure there in May, we asked our leadership team, hey, no hard feelings. I'm out the door. You don't have to worry about me. Do you guys want to keep doing this with, with the new principal that's coming in? And, and there was a resounding yes. So um, we, did never, we never did an official survey of them, but I feel like that would have stopped with me leaving. Um, but they're, they're trying to, to keep rolling uh, where, where we left off. <clears throat> Jason, there's a couple really cool like school culture things that I picked out from the things you were saying there. The one, the fact that they kept doing it after you left, that's a huge indicator that it was working. That's huge. Something that can, and there's, there's turnover everywhere. If they can get programs going and they, they maintain that, that speaks a lot about implementation. I love the idea of the, the soft rollout you did. That's something you find like across, uh, like across the country, different schools, things work when you start small and then build it bigger. Um, so you can build some buy-in. Um, I love how much student choice is, is in the program and not just student choice, but like in like what they're going to buy, but like how they're going to use the, use it too. like that's that's the layers. there are awesome. And anytime you can connect things to the real world, you, you, you build some relevance in, into what you're doing. I had a, a, a question I'm curious on 
when you were doing your planning process or if it ever came up, I think there's probably some logistical concerns, but like just from like how close it was to real world finances and stuff, was there a way for the kids to earn a raise? Oh, that's, that's what I came up with. Like yes. if, they, if they had consistent yeah. behavior, like could they, could their $17 a day go up? Yeah. So um, that was, oh gosh. Um, what I'm visualizing in my head right now is a vertical number line. So math teacher, right? So envision zero on a, on a, ver a thermometer, right? That's their 17 points where they came in every day, right? And if they were not doing what they needed to work ethic or behavior, they were being taken away. So those were being removed and going downwards. But our district did a great job with two programs. Uh, one was local to the district called uh, Pirates Rock. And the other one was uh, Character Strong, which is a national uh, character uh, uh, SEL uh, program that's being implemented throughout the country. And so to reinforce all those character lessons and traits we were working on, if a, if a staff member saw a kid going above and beyond in any of those areas. So this, this goes beyond behavior and work ethic, like perseverance or forgiveness, commitment, whatever it may be. They could leave them a comment and add additional points to an individual or to a whole class or a group of kids. And so um, when you say raise, that's what I'm thinking. Like there's that baseline, right? But my bonus is going above and beyond. So that definitely was a, an aspect. What's challenging, and this is true of so many areas of education, is trying to find a consistent use of that for teachers, right? Whereas like um, I might be giving a little bit more freely and Anna might do it on occasion and you might never give, right? And so that's that's always a challenge because um, kids see that they they have eight different teachers throughout the day and and they and they can and they can pick up on that. And that's that's tough. But after year one, I thought we did an okay, okay job with that. Cool thing is the ratios that you can pull in live school and the reporting to see how everyone's doing with that is, is a good tool for us to see that as well. What do you think would be like the, the first hurdle to overcome? If, if somebody on the call was like, you know what, I'm going to do this next year. What, 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 what pushback would you expect? I don't think you, well, let's, I think, let's think about pushback from different lenses, right? So lens one central office. So that was actually, the first people I went to go talk with uh, was two of my direct bosses um, to pitch them the vision, uh, costs, uh, capacity, training, things of that nature. Um, and so I think that's an important piece. Um, I think uh, a hurdle is getting the people on your leadership team, uh, if you're building function that way, to ensure that that they that they support you and have your backs. Um, and uh partnerships are huge right like you can't you can't it's well that's a double-edged sword i was when we built out our our offerings those were all student driven um that was me talking with kids when they're in my office uh that was me surveying kids on our leadership teams um and figuring out what they loved and cared about in a perfect world the, i mentioned the credit reinvestment act okay going into this I was going to target 80 to $90 a kid from a bank, which was going to be like a budget of 30 to $40,000 a year. And when I shared that with people that I was um, strategizing with going into this, they didn't blink an eye at that number. Like for me in education, that sounds like a tremendous amount of money to ask for in, in a year. Um, but if your, if your school falls in a low income area and uh, there is much advantage to the bank to show they're reinvesting in those areas. Um, and so if you can secure that kind of funding, like in a perfect world, we had an Amazon account with our district. I would love to say, hey, this amount of live school points equals this amount of dollars on Amazon. You submit your Google form on what you want. We buy it for you. It shows up and you spend it that way. That was the dream. And I just ran into the roadblock of securing that amount of funding. I, I went on a year's worth. That, that's what I will say one obstacle was, is I spent a year while we were doing a soft rollout, trying to find as many partners and partnerships and donations, financial or services and goods. Um, because I knew if, if there wasn't something that was, that mattered to kids, then it doesn't matter that they have live school points in their bank account, right? So leadership team, central office. Um, I didn't have to do much parent prep um, I, I don't think that was a, a major concern, 
I was actually shocked at uh, the only pushback I ever had from parents was that we took points away for absences. Sorry, guys, I'm going to plug in because I'm running out of battery here. Uh, am I good? Is there yeah, like, yeah. so I had, I had some parents and some kids that pushed back on, Hey, I, I'm, I'm losing points for going to the doctor, you know? And we talked about, we connected to the real world. Like if I'm working an hourly job at a fast food restaurant or a car wash or whatever it may be, chances are they don't have paid leave. Right. And so if they leave, they're not making that money while they're gone. And so we got to have those discussions and talk about that. Um, but not a lot of parent prep. I would just say definitely do a soft rollout, figure out the kinks on a small scale before you roll it out big, big time. Um, and just those parties I mentioned, partnerships, central office, and, you know, your core group of teachers. That's what I would say. I like that you mentioned the, the Amazon piece. That that sounds like a really cool thing because I was, I was thinking when I was going through this because I love this idea. And I was thinking like Ed, the planning phase, there could be, you could almost get a little carried away. Like what's the big idea that just seemed like it was probably too big. What was, what was the part you just couldn't do? Other than, I guess other than the Amazon piece. You, no, you nailed it. Uh, it was, it was the Amazon piece and, and we did it on a small scale. Right. And so one thing we did was, I think it was like 200 or 250 points, which to give you perspective based on the way we were distributing points, that would be maybe a quarter or a third of the points they could earn in one quarter, right? So what we would give them is a $20 credit on Amazon to buy a book. So they were they, they could go on there and they could find any book that they want and they got up to $20 worth of credit on that. And so how we paid for that was um, after school, we ran uh, candy, we'd go to Costco or Sam's, buy a ton of candy, drinks. Um, uh, one partnership I formed was with Hippies. If you're unfamiliar with Hippies, Hippies is like the healthy Cheeto of today made from chickpeas. And so they sent me, I, I mean, hundreds of bags, like the big bags that you see at Costco or Sam's um, for, and we didn't have to pay for that. Right. And like kids, kids were spending their money on things that we got for free. Um, and so that was uh, a Amazon is, is the pipe dream. I think that's, that would blow kids socks off. Um, but I think that's where the partnering with banks and trying to get that funding that unfortunately based on where my school landed, I couldn't access the funding like some others might be able to. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think Amazon's super cool and relevant for kids and easy. It was really easy for us to use. So we had a question in the chat from Vanessa and I'm, I'm going to reword it a little bit so, so you can answer it. Okay. So she's, she's a teacher and uh, I, I take it Vanessa, you teach financial literacy and you, and you want to do this. You would like to do this school wide. If, if you were a principal and like this, this idea was coming from your staff, what would you want them to have when they came to talk to you about this? How would, what, what, what would they need to do to convince you to do this? So it kind of turned around a little bit because you, you were already on board, obviously, but like if you weren't. Yeah, no, that's tough because, because I, because I'm obviously a believer, but I will tell you, um, okay, so Vanessa speaking to you directly, I, prior to rolling this out at my school, I tried to get my high school principal on board with this. And I try to get the other middle schools, uh, the other middle school on board with it. And um, no matter what program um, we, there's programs created out there every day to help kids with math, with reading, with financial literacy, fill in the blank. If you don't have people that are willing to go above and beyond and are passionate about it, um, then no matter how good a program is, it's nothing without people. Uh, and so what I'm trying to say, say about that is if, if you're passionate about this, and let's say your principal's not, um, because keep in mind, my evaluation, my R scoring as a, as a building, right, as a district had nothing to do with this. Right. Like, so we could be nailing this out of the water and on paper to the public or to, you know, to the state. It, it really it really because because it's not valued in the same way that other things are, um, it's not a priority. 
And so, you know, I guess my advice for you would be, how do you make something that's not a part of someone's evaluation or a part of a school's rank, rating, how do you make it relevant and matter? And so some of the ways that I think you can do that is how do you weave this into the math classroom? So for instance, in seventh grade math, there are a ton of connections to calculating interest and um, percent of change and things of that nature. So when we were doing investments for our stock, that the kids could actually take what they were learning in class and apply it to live school and what they were doing. So I think finding those direct connections, um, you're, it sounds like you're probably at a high school. I'm going to go ahead and guess. Uh, if that's the case, personal finance is likely offered. And therefore, you're obviously going to make great connections to that. Um, but I bore the burden since I brought this of doing all the extra stuff, right? Going out and finding the partnerships, building out the spreadsheets, doing of that. And then I was fortunate enough to have people around me, um, whether it was people in the front office, uh, my instructional coach that jumped on board and said, yeah, we're, we're going to help you with this. We're going to create the slide deck. We're going to manage the Google request forms that come in all day, right? For the daily store or for the weekly auctions or things of that nature. So you have to have a group of people. If you're going to the principal, you got you don't want to add anything to that person's plate, but you want to be able to show this matters to us. It's going to make a positive impact in this way. And here's all the people that are going to be able to help bring this to life and make it function. I think that's that would be my recommendation if I was going vertical with it. Um, cause that, that's a similar conversation and how I had with central office, right. Was you guys aren't going to have to do anything other than help me with purchasing live school. All the rest is going to be done on our shoulders and here's the potential impact we believe it's going to make. So. And so that, I think that's a fantastic answer. And we got another question in too, as well from Ethan. Um, and if. Uh, I'll read out what he wrote. Uh, did you ever yeah. have students create a physical budget themselves of how they would want to spend their points? Great question, Ethan. And that's something that the busy, that's what we wanted to do. Um, and there are tools online for like adults, right? That are very adulty. Sorry for my vocabulary, but they're, they're very much so like the things we would deal with in real life. Um, we never got in that first year to the point where we produced that from, but it was a hundred percent a need. Um, and you know, it's the chicken or the egg. Like, do you give them a budgeting tool and teach them what to do to set them up for success or, and, or do you allow them to fail? Right. And we had kids like something that was kind of a struggle at first in isolation until we talked through it was we had kids that typically didn't make incentive for quarterly incentive, make it because they saved enough to buy it and they weren't spending it recklessly. And so that was hard for some staff at first. Um, but we had some kids that would typically make it, not make it because they were spending like there was no tomorrow, right? Like like money was growing on trees. And so I, I think that was a huge life lesson. Like in the real world, I, I could be making poor decisions, but if I'm managing my money and taking care of it, I still have access to some things that, you know, someone else may say I shouldn't have access to, or no matter how much money, if I'm making, if I'm blowing it like crazy, I'm going to run out. And so um, that's a very long answer. The, the short answer is no, we didn't get to that point, but we needed to. Um, but I also think learning by just making mistakes was, was really good for them. Cool. Thank you for that. Yeah. So I think we're, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. We, it's 11.45 a.m. my time. I'm on the West Coast, 1.45 p.m. your time. So we've uh, hit it right at the mark. I really wanted to thank you for your time today. This was um, so well done and I learned a lot um, and I'm eager to see what other people do with this information, how they can connect financial literacy to some of the work they're doing with behavior too. So thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you guys for the opportunity. And like I said, um, my email and uh, cell phone were in there. Feel free to reach out. Um, as you hopefully can tell, I'm passionate about it. Uh, this is what this is what makes me miss, honestly, of all things, being back at schools just to make an impact on people's lives that aren't mandated by the state, right? But like something that we know is needed. So I hope at least one person you know has an opportunity to uh, to take this and and keep going. So thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you so much. Bye, everyone.